Good morning. <laughs> I am Carly Jennings, uh, Donna's, Donna's daughter-in-law. Uh, I'm married to that bearded redhead in the back, the only guy here. <laughs> um, we're from Calvary Chapel, Merritt Island, uh, where Josh is the sound tech, and I have just recently been blessed with a job there as well. I am now um, officially the secretary at CC Merritt Island, so <laughs> if you ever need to reach me, <laughs> you know where to call. Um, that has just totally been the Lord as well, just the way he's been working in our lives lately. Um, and I feel beyond blessed to get to work there every day with my church family. So <laughs> let's get into it. <laughs> So this is now my fourth time getting to come to Donna's conferences, and I can honestly say that it has become one of the highlights of my year. Of all the conferences and events that I get to go to or take part in, this is by far my favorite. Now that being said, I knew that eventually this day would come. <laughs> the fateful year where Donna inevitably would ask me to pray about speaking. You all know what I'm talking about. If you know Donna well, then you know that feeling. Will it be this year? I know she's going to ask me eventually, but thankfully we all know as well how much Donna is in constant communication with the Lord and how nothing she ever does is outside of prayer. So the minute I got that email from her asking me to pray about speaking at this conference, I immediately knew, <laughs> well, I know Donna only asks people that the Lord has placed on her heart, so I guess I'm doing this. Uh, I dragged my feet for a week or two, but really I think I knew from the beginning that this is what the Lord wanted me to do. And so I'm here today to talk about loss, grief, trials, brokenness, and through all of it, being under the shadow of the Lord's swings. If you have a Bible and you'd like to turn with me, I'm going to be reading from 1 Samuel chapter 1. There was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jer Jeroham, son of Elihu, son of Tohu, son of Zuf, and Ephrathite. He had two wives, the name of one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. Now this man used to go up year by year from his city to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts at Shiloh where the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were priests of the Lord. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to Penina, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. And her rival used to provoke her grievously to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year, as often as she went up to the house of the Lord. She used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. And Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep, and why do you not eat? And why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk in Shiloh, Hannah rose. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. And she vowed a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the afflictions of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was speaking in her heart, only her lips moved, and her voice was not heard. Therefore, Eli took her to be a drunken woman. And Eli said to her, How long will you go on being drunk? Put your wine away from you. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. 
<sighs> they rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord. Then they went back to their house at Ramah, and Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. And in due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. And she called his name Samuel, for she said, I have asked for him from the Lord. There are four main things I want to talk about today. Grief, prayer, our testimonies, and how the Lord uses us through trials. Firstly, I'm going to start by sharing a condensed version of my 2020 year. My story begins in early February of 2020 at a Sunday night service. One of our pastors was doing a weekly series where he did a case study of sorts on the people of First and Second Samuel. And that evening, it was on Hannah. Something about the message that evening, about Hannah, hearing how Hannah's heart longed so desperately for a child, it got Josh and I thinking about trying ourselves. We had already briefly talked about it over the weeks prior, but that evening we decided, let's do it, let's give it a try. And if it's the Lord's will, then we'll get pregnant. It didn't take long. By Valentine's Day, I knew that I was pregnant. I hadn't taken a test yet. I haven't, hadn't even missed a period yet, but I knew in my spirit. So I waited a couple days more until my period was considered late and took three tests, all of which came back positive. We were pregnant. My prayer during all this time had been, Lord, if it's your will, let us get pregnant. It was indeed his will, but as we all know, sometimes the Lord has a will and plans for us that are beyond what we could even imagine. For a couple happy weeks, everything was great. We began planning all the fun things you plan, nursery themes, gender reveals, and all those joyful landmarks that you look forward to. You start thinking about what will they be like? Will they have our personality, our hair, or eye color? Things were progressing fine, uh, nothing out of the ordinary. Our nine-week ultrasound starts to get close, and I remember there being one day where I was suddenly not as tired as usual, and I just felt very strange. And I distinctly remember saying to my mom, is it weird that I don't feel pregnant today? <laughs> I said I wasn't gonna look at you. <sighs> I tried not to think too much about it, but I think I knew that day that something wasn't right. The time for the ultrasound comes around. We get in the room. We get in the room, and the nurse is very quietly looking around for that heartbeat. She's not saying a word. As the minutes tick, I'm starting to get a little nervous. Then she says, all right, go ahead and get dressed, and I'm going to go get the doctor. And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> what do you mean, go ahead and get dressed? Uh, I'm new to this and all, but I know that this is not how ultrasounds go. Where's the heartbeat? Why didn't you show it to us? All these thoughts rushing through my head as I silently get dressed and Josh and I wait for the doctor. She brings us into her office after an excruciatingly long couple of minutes, sits us down and tells us, I'm sorry, but there was no heartbeat. Ooh, sorry. And as she hands me the ultrasound picture, she says, also, it was twins. And in that moment, I lost it. I had always wanted twins. The intense wave of grief and sorrow that swept over me felt like enough to drown me. I didn't even know how to speak. All that came out was sobs. <sighs> we all left the office in shock. We had had to take two separate cars to the appointment. And that drive home, it's a miracle I didn't crash. Sorry. <sighs> Through the sobs and hyperventilating, I just kept praying. Lord, maybe it was wrong, or if it wasn't, you are the God of miracles. Let there be two heartbeats in there. You can literally start their hearts if you want to. That is how great you are. 
I still know without a doubt my God is in fact the God of miracles and that he could have put those two heartbeats inside of me. But I also know now that it was not his will. We went in for a second opinion a week later and still no heartbeats. We had lost our twins at eight and nine weeks old. I won't try to describe to you the details of where my mind was at over the months that followed. I probably wouldn't be able to. All I can really remember is a cloud of grief and depression hanging over my head. I would burst out crying randomly. I would go through mixed feelings of, let's try again, to no, we can't, I'm afraid of what might happen. I would be afraid to talk to anyone because they might mention it. But then I would get upset and hurt if people didn't ask me how I was doing and if I was okay. My emotions were such a tangled mess, and I don't think I really even knew what I wanted or how I felt. But mainly what was constantly ringing through my head and heart was, why? Why God? Did I do something wrong? Why has this happened? Why are they gone? And why do I feel so broken? <sighs> the prayers of my heart at this time were those of confusion, lament, and sorrow. I was broken broken in heart and spirit. <sighs> Goodness, sorry. Hannah, I imagine, felt quite the same as she was praying that prayer when Eli found her, thinking her to be drunk. But she said to him, No, my Lord, I am a woman troubled in spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for all along I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation. Hannah was a woman whose heart was grieved. She had longed so desperately to be a mother, but the Lord had closed her womb. After a few months, we decided to start trying again. We assumed it would take quickly, just like the first time. But as the months passed, I found myself feeling more and more discouraged and scared. But then five months after the first miscarriage, we finally got pregnant again. Just like the first time, I could tell very early on, I just had that feeling. So I took a test and it was positive. We were pregnant again. What was truly amazing about when it finally happened is that this was all right around the time of when our first due date was supposed to be. It felt like such beautiful timing and we were rejoicing and thanking the Lord. We told both our parents, and we were suddenly allowing ourselves to get excited about the future again. I kept telling myself, don't get into the fear, don't give into the fear. Everything will be all right, it won't happen again. But about four days later, I started bleeding a concernable amount, and I felt sick to my stomach. I knew something wasn't, was wrong again. It was another failed pregnancy. Another baby lost. Oh, this one had only been about four weeks along, which is known as a chemical pregnancy, but a loss is a loss no matter what size or when it happens. Oh, I should have worn waterproof mascara. <laughs> <laughs> the pain of this one was easier to bear though. I had become all too familiar with that grief and despair and was prepared for it. Even though I had told myself not to let the fear in, I had. It was the mentality of, if I expect the worst, then it won't, I won't be as disappointed when it happens. Can I tell you that thinking is not biblical? That is not of the Lord. That is allowing fear and anxiety to rule your heart. I have been guilty of this for most of my adult life. <laughs> I have always struggled with depression and anxiety since high school. And it was some, it is something I have always had to constantly give to the Lord. One of my life verses has always been Philippians 4, 6 through 7. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind through Christ Jesus. When we look at Eli's response to Hannah's grief, 
and anxiety-led prayers. He says, go in peace, and the God of Israel grant your petition that you have made to him. And Hannah said, let your servant find favor in your eyes. Then the woman went her way and ate, and her face was no longer sad. You know what I love about Hannah's response after praying? The minute she gave her heart's request over to the Lord, she was at peace. Her face was no longer sad. That is the power of his peace which surpasses our understanding. Despite what we may be going through, when the world tells you you should be feeling pain, fear, anxiety, anger, bitterness, the Lord tells you, do not fear, for I am with you. Even though I don't know the answers to all the whys, I can now confidently lift up my face and no longer be sad. Because despite the excruciating loss of my babies, I have the Lord's peace to lean on. And the confidence of knowing that when I let my requests be made known to the Lord, he hears them. Oh, the Lord heard Hannah's prayer, though he had closed her womb before. In his perfect love and timing, he opened it and gave her Samuel. Oh, we know from reading Hannah's story that the Lord had never left her. In her time of grief, he was there. In her time of joy, he was there. He was always by her side. And he had, he had never left me either. Through this past year, he has been with me through it all, weeping with me, comforting me, and binding my wounds. And it's because of Hannah's trials that we now have her beautiful testimony in the Lord's word, a testimony that shows of his love for her and his faithfulness. And it's testimonies like this that show us how the Lord can use us even in times when we feel completely and utterly broken. As I have been healing over this past year, one thing that has been an amazing outlet and form of therapy for me has been my art. After the second miscarriage, I made this piece, which Josh will put up on the screen, I hope. Yeah. Uh, it was a piece that had been on my mind and heart for a while, ever since the first miscarriage. While I had been pregnant with the twins, one of the things I had been excited about was getting to do maternity pictures. You know, the ones where the mother is holding her belly like that. <clears throat> oh no, now I lost where I was. <laughs> oh. But after I had lost those three babies, I couldn't get this image out of my head of brokenness in my arms where they should have been. So I poured my emotions out as I drew this, and as I was drawing, a memory popped into my head of something I had heard years ago. In Japan, there is an art called Kintsu Kuroi, where broken pottery is repaired with gold lacquer. The flaw is then seen as a unique part of the object's history, and the piece is then seen as more beautiful for having been broken. In the same way, this life is full of trials and challenges that can leave us feeling broken beyond repair. But I praise the Lord daily, knowing that He uses these trials to test us and bring us forth as gold. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James 1, 2-3 the Lord will refine us, and it will probably hurt, but that's the point. The refining fire will burn, but when we come out, we are as gold, having been perfected by the Lord. That is why we count all these trials as blessings. That is why, despite the hardships that 2020 brought to so many people, we can count ourselves blessed who trust in the Lord. Those cracks on that pot are the scars left by the loss of my babies. Though I would have given anything to get to hold them in my arms and to have the great honor of being their mom, I still praise the Lord for my scars. Because like Hannah, they show of my testimony to the Lord. Just like the broken pottery fixed with gold paint, they tell a story of when I was broken and then healed. Because throughout it all, the Lord was walking beside me every step of the way, and He heals the brokenhearted and binds their wounds. I like to imagine that he binds them in gold lacquer and calls us, his creations, more beautiful for having been broken. <sighs> so
so I felt like the Lord was placing it on my heart this past week or past two weeks as I was praying about whether or not I should speak um, to make up this picture in a different, in a couple different uh, variations. And so I had them printed out and put on a table in the, in the hallway area out there. One of my prayers throughout all of this is that somehow the Lord could use what I've been through to bless someone else. So I wanted to print out different versions in a hope that it might speak to different women individually. So if you are currently hurting or maybe feeling a bit broken, or if you know of someone who is, please feel free to grab a picture from the table, and I pray that it blesses someone in some way. So now we come to today. It has just been over a year since the first miscarriage and six months since the second, and the healing has come slowly with time. But my heart rejoices in being able to say to you all right now that the Lord has healed me of my grief and sorrow. I still pray that it would be in his will for me to be a mother someday soon. But I rest in the peace of knowing that he is in control and whatever his plan is, it is perfect. I don't have the answers to everything and I don't know what the future holds right now, but I have these truths that I can lean on. Firstly, my babies are in heaven, resting in the arms of Jesus. And though I never got to hold them here on earth, I will one day. Secondly, I have a loving God who hears my prayers and has a perfect plan for my life. And thirdly, that throughout everything that has happened, I have never once left the shadow of the Lord's wing. Oh, and that's all I've got for today. <laughs>